The big day. What comes to your mind when you hear that phrase? Maybe it's sports. If you're a college football fan, by Tuesday, you're already thinking about the big game on Saturday against your team's rival. You're thinking about the food you're going to eat, the people you're going to watch the game with, and who you're going to be texting and giving a hard time when your team wins. Maybe the big day makes you think of a romantic relationship. You can be a week and a half out from that second date with the person you really like, and it's all you can think about. You can be six months out from your wedding date, and it consumes everything. We have all sorts of big days. The baby's due date, meeting one of your heroes, the interview for your dream job, the release of the big movie, or the final episode of your favorite show. Think of how large those days loom in your mind, how they spill over on your calendar so that all the days around them are only important in relationship to that day. It's like those days take on a gravitational force greater than all the ones around them. They're so massive, so substantial, that they pull everything around them into their orbit. You still go to work and shop for dinner and pay the water bill, but that's just the stuff you do while you orbit around the big day. Everything revolves around it. The aim of these sessions is to recover what the Bible has to say about the ultimate big day. The one that caused Martin Luther to say, there are only two days on my calendar, today and that day. It's the day the Old Testament calls the day of Yahweh, and the New Testament radically renames the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. It's the day the angels spoke of at Jesus' ascension when they said, he will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. It's the day when the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. It's the day when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire to inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and to be marveled at among all who have believed. It is the day when Jesus appears and we shall see him as he is. This is the ultimate big day, the final big day, the day when Jesus returns. So if the wedding or the big game or the job interview holds gravitational force in your life, bending all other events and priorities around it, how much more should this day of Jesus' appearing transform how you live every day until then. There's a phrase Peter uses that captures the posture we are to have toward this day. In 1 Peter 1.13, he tells the early Christians to hope fully in the grace that we will experience when Jesus is revealed. And those two words, hope fully, represent where we're going with this. We're not going to be creating elaborate charts or trying to figure out how an event we just saw in the news ties into biblical prophecy. No, we are here to see how this hope in Jesus' promise returned transforms how we live today. My guess is that if you're watching this, you believe Jesus is coming back. Like me, you trust his promise that he will return. And yet, if we're honest, our posture toward this reality is described more in the word hopefully than the words hope fully. We use the word hopefully with a shrug. It's something we'd like to see happen and truly hope happens, but we're not going to put money on it. I start every college football season hoping that my Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets will do great, but I don't hold my breath for it. I hear all the campaign promises of politicians when they ask for my vote. Do I think they're going to do all those things? Hopefully, but who knows? Will all the money I'm putting into Social Security be there when I retire? Hopefully, but it's not at the center of my financial plan. That kind of hopefully shrug toward Jesus' is coming will do nothing to actually change how we live in the way the New Testament authors expect it will. Their call for us to hope fully is what we want to talk about. Think, think about what that looks like in everyday life. When our family truly believes that somebody is coming over for dinner, 
we actually get out the vacuum cleaner and tell the kids to put down their screens because it's time to get to work and clean up this place. When you know that the big day is coming, uh, the big game is coming in four days, or the wedding is coming up in four months, you purchase things, you invite people, you clear your schedule, and you plan for the space to make that event happen. Or think about how you treat food. When our family used to live in Arizona and our relatives were on the East Coast, we would fly often through the Charlotte airport. I'm a good Southern boy and love good Southern cooking. So when we knew that we would be walking through the Charlotte airport past one of the best soul food restaurants I've ever eaten at, it affected what I said to the cabin crew on the airplane when they offered snacks. It didn't matter how good that cookie or bag of peanuts looked, if they weren't offering me fried chicken, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, or fried okra, I was going to say no thank you to those snacks so I could say yes to that comfort food when we landed. That is hope fully. When hope transforms how you live today. As John wrote, those who hope in Jesus' is appearing purify themselves even as he is pure. As Paul wrote, waiting for our blessed hope trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. The aim of these sessions is to move us from a lifeless, hopefully, to a life-changing hope fully. Now, from the jump, there are a few questions that probably pop up in your mind as we talk about the return of Jesus. The first is about all those predictions that have been made in past centuries about the timing of Jesus' return. I remember hearing someone quote Matthew 24, 36 and claim, Jesus may have said that no one knows the day or the hour, but he didn't say that no one knows the month or the year. So every generation has a new person who comes up with some complicated mathematical formula for why they know when Jesus is coming. Whether it's 88 reasons why Jesus will come in 1988 or Harold Camping proclaiming on his radio show that Jesus would definitely return on May 21st, 2011, there have been predictions not only in our century, but in every century since Jesus made his promise that he would come again. In the same way, almost every generation sees the evil in their midst as evidence that the apocalypse is near, that the end is nigh. Now, if these were right, it would make it much easier to anticipate Jesus' return. It's like having an advent calendar and counting down the days to Christmas as you open each one. If you know that you're going to open those presents on December 25th, you can manage your eagerness and excitement leading up to that day. But I really do believe Jesus when he said that no one knows the day or the hour. Now, I'm not going to give you any predictions about when the return of Christ will be. Sadly, all the past prognostications can leave us jaded, thinking we should just not bother ourselves with Jesus' return at all. Yet the New Testament won't let us do this. It calls us to a real hope in Jesus' appearing. So this brings the other question up, really the million dollar question, how do we live out this full, robust, life-changing hope when we don't know when Jesus will return. I believe we see what hope fully looks like in the life of the Apostle Paul. Two of Paul's earliest letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, are permeated with references to the coming of Jesus. When I read these letters, I hear a man who is convinced that he is going to see Jesus come back in person. In the 10 years between writing 1 Thessalonians and Philippians, Paul experienced much of the persecution and near-death experiences recorded in the later chapter of Acts. Beatings, stoning, shipwreck, imprisonment, and the incitement of more than one riot. All the while, Jesus is still in heaven and Paul is still on earth, suffering for his sake. But when you read the book of Philippians, you hear a shift in Paul's tone. Now he's talking about the fact that he may see Jesus not at Jesus' coming, but when Paul dies and sees Christ in heaven. Paul is sitting in prison, awaiting the verdict on whether or not he will be executed, 
and he has to come to terms with the fact that he may die before Jesus returns. Yet, that does not stop Paul from writing in Philippians 3 that our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. This change of tone gets solidified by the end of Paul's life as he's writing his final letter. He knows that he's going to die. In 2 Timothy 2, 4 and 5, he pens his famous words, The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In this final season of life, his sights remain set on the coming of his Savior as he anticipated receiving the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. To the death, Paul loved Jesus' appearing. He could approach his death with great confidence because this hope had propelled Paul to a faithful life with and for Jesus. In a touching portion of 1 Thessalonians, he imagines presenting these new believers as his crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming. All those long hours of teaching, modeling, correcting, and encouraging would be worth it as he said, here they are, Jesus. I did what you told me to do. And this kind of hope can fuel your life and ministry as well. If you find yourself feeling impatient with immature believers, if you feel the brokenness of the world in your own body, if you find yourself facing afflictions because of your stand for Christ, Paul serves as a model of how a full hope in Jesus can fuel your perseverance through these difficulties. Even if Jesus comes back the day after you die, your yearning to see him face to face right now can give you the long strides needed for a faithful life in ministry. We have an exciting journey ahead of us in these sessions. We're going to get our bearings on where Jesus' return fits into the big picture of the biblical story. We're going to focus on particular images of Jesus' return, like Jesus' bridegroom or warrior king. We're going to look at practical spiritual disciplines the New Testament lays out that help us nurture this love of Jesus' appearing. And we're going to look at the specific ways that this kind of hope should purify our hearts, propel our ministry, and fuel perseverance through affliction. My prayer is that God will stir up new and fresh affections of joy, love, and longing for Jesus in your heart as you embark on this journey. A church filled with believers eager to see their Lord will be a church of radical obedience, bold gospel proclamation, and increasing holiness. May the Spirit do this as we cry, Come, Lord Jesus.